Hello everybody, welcome back. We're in John chapter 8 and I'll try and remember to speak it directly into the microphone. So hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. This is something I'm going to have to train myself to do, discipline myself to speak into the microphone because in the last video I kept forgetting and obviously not everything was as clear as it could be or should be but the audio I think does sound somewhat better anyway I do appreciate you taking the time to listen we're going to talk about the woman they had set in the midst, the woman of John chapter 8. The woman standing in the midst. And we'll go through this passage from verse 1 down to verse 11 or 12 probably verse 12 actually and I want to talk about a little bit of the context from the previous chapter because verses 1 and 2 here do tend to get skipped over a little bit at least when I've heard others speak on this verse 1 says Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple so just looking at this first part here Jesus was up on the Mount of Olives and early in the morning so it would seem Jesus has been there during the night, maybe overnight, and at the end of John chapter 7 we have people in the evening going each one to their houses. So just briefly, John chapter 7 speaks about a feast, a feast day in Jerusalem, in Judea. And Jesus is speaking at the temple and the scripture tells us that the people were divided because of him so Jesus was garnering gaining more attention and many were beginning to believe on him some of them even saying that he, Jesus, is the Christ. Others weren't sure. And during that whole episode, the Pharisees were becoming more and more angry that people were listening to Jesus. And the more that people listened to Jesus, the more extreme the response from the Pharisees was. In fact, as you go through John chapter 7, you can see that they, the Pharisees, expose themselves more and more as the chapter goes on. Every time they speak, they dig themselves deeper and deeper into their position and it's a very interesting chapter they send the officers of the temple the temple guards or police however you want to describe them but the officers of the temple they send them out to arrest Jesus and when the officers come back without him they're really annoyed 
they're really annoyed and demand to know why they haven't arrested him and the officers say something like never have we were heard one speak such as this one before or never have we heard a man speak such as this before and as the Pharisees begin working themselves up into quite a tizzy Nicodemus who's also a Pharisee is there with them and he tries to just bring the levels down he says well shouldn't we hear out a person before we judge them and the Pharisees turn around to Nicodemus and say art thou also from Galilee really exposing themselves bearing in mind this is a feast day they are at the temple there are many many travelers that have come Jews from Galilee come up to Jerusalem for the feast days so there are many dozens hundreds maybe even thousands of Jews from Galilee walking through the temple around worshipping paying their dues and respects for the feast and the Pharisees really I don't know if you would say implode or explode but they proclaim that no good thing came out of Galilee no prophet came out of Galilee which of course is wrong scripture tells us that Jonah and his father were both Galileans it's in the Old Testament and it all becomes quite a debacle and the chapter ends with every man returning unto his own house so we can imagine that the Jews or the Jews that live there of Jerusalem are going home to search out their scriptures to see if what the Pharisees are saying is true and here we are in John chapter 8 so the Pharisees have really set their position out by this time and this of course is the chapter in which the Pharisees declare full all out war with Christ I'll show you some scripture at the end here so for example in verse 37 Jesus says I know that ye are Abraham's seed he's talking about physical seed but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you again in verse 40 Jesus says but now ye seek to kill me ye seek to kill me a man that have told you the truth which I have heard of God this did not Abraham ye do the deeds of your father and said they to him we be not born of fornication we have one father even God going down to verse 44 Jesus says ye are of your father the devil so the Pharisees think they worship the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and Jesus says no you don't ye are of your father the devil 
a murderer from the beginning. No truth in him. A liar and the father of it, a father of lies. The Jews said unto him, to Jesus, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? And then, as we go down, at the end of the chapter 8 here, Then took they up stones to cast at him, they seek to put Christ to death. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And the thing about the Pharisees, or all these unbelieving Jews, is that they reject, they rejected and unto this day still reject the Trinity. They said we have one Father, even God, but they reject that God has a Son and that the Son came, Jesus Christ, because if we go to John chapter uh, 10, John chapter 10, in verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again. So this the second time. John chapter 8 is the first time they took up stones to cast at him. Here in John 10, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not. So it's important to understand that they would have accepted Christ on his works because he did miracles, he healed people, he did many amazing things. For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And it's not only that the Jews, or the unbelieving Jews, reject the Trinity, the triune nature of the three persons in God. But if you do any research on Judaism, they also reject that God is male. So two things about Judaism and why it can't be accepted to God denial of the Son and the Trinity and denial that God is male. That's the context. The context coming into John chapter 8 is that the Pharisees had already began in their mind to make war against Christ and here in John chapter 8 they're actually going full out to declare war against him, culminating in them picking up stones to stone him at the end of this chapter. So Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. So, what do these first two verses tell us? Well, the Mount of Olives is 
at the eastern side of Jerusalem it's a fairly sizable hill it looks down over the Temple Mount which is kind of immediately below it and then beyond the Temple Mount you have the city with the houses laid out and you can look at this on Google Maps or Google Earth or whatever there's ways you can look at the layout of Jerusalem the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives online and it's pretty much still laid out today as it would have been then with the the houses facing facing east facing toward the temple or the temple mount as it is today so early in the morning sunrise or thereabouts maybe just a little bit after the sun is behind Christ as it's rising as Jesus is walking down from the Mount of Olives he's overlooking the Temple Mount and the houses of the city of Jerusalem and he has the light behind him so the city is being just being lit up in front of him and I think this may be relevant because in the next verse the scribes the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and had her set in the midst the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery now in these early hours at sunrise if anybody's scuttling around from house to house or being somewhere they shouldn't be the time to return to where they should be would be before the hubbub of a daily life begins and Jesus can see it he can see it all as he's walking down from the Mount of Olives at sunrise early morning if anything's going on Jesus can see exactly where it's happening whether it be a man or a woman moving from house to house in the early hours Jesus is gonna see it And let me tell you something about Jesus' eyesight. Well, in fact, I won't tell you. I'll let Scripture tell you. We'll go to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, the feeding of 5,000 men. And immediately after this straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go over to go to the other side before and to Bethsaida so they're on the western coast of the Sea of Galilee Jesus instructs the disciples to get aboard the ship and row or sail to Bethsaida on the north coast on the northern shore and when he had sent them away he departed into a mountain to pray so Jesus has gone up onto a mountain and when even that's evening when even was come the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land so the disciples have gone have gone ahead of him they're following his instruction the ship is in the midst of the sea so if you know about the Sea of Galilee across east to west it's about seven miles or seven to eight miles across 
and from north to south it's uh, a little bit more maybe a few miles longer in length from north to south but they're going they're on the western coast the western shore at a, a town or city called Tiberias and they've set off from Tiberias up to go up toward Bethsaida so if they're in the midst of the sea they're about three miles out maybe a little bit more three to four miles out so the ship was in the midst of the sea and he Jesus alone on the land he's still up on the mountain and he saw them toiling in rowing for the wind was contrary unto them or contrary unto them so Jesus eyesight it's evening or it's even sundown sunset it's either dark or getting dark but it's not good daylight at this point the ship is maybe about three miles out three miles and it's hitting is running into a storm we know this is a storm that it's coming into and he saw them not the ship it wasn't just the ship Jesus saw he actually saw the people on the ship toiling in rowing think about this three miles out which this is supernatural eyesight three miles out he can see men it's not clear daylight it's even evening the sun's going down and also the ship has already because they're toiling it's already hit a storm so he can at, in the dark he can see men in a ship three or more miles away in a storm that's Jesus eyesight that's amazing yeah so let's go back to John 8 so early in the morning I don't even think it matters that he's got the Sun up behind him but the Sun would be lighting up the front of all these houses on the other side of the Temple Mount he would see them from his elevated position on the Mount of Olives also he's been there all night so he knows even in the dark he can he can see if he was sat there watching he would know exactly what's going on okay so the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said unto him unto Jesus master this woman was taken in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned but what sayest thou well by the law both parties would be the accused not just the woman I know other people have pointed this out as well before but it's very true the law demands that both parties be tried and look at this Moses in the law Moses in the law commanded us well the law commands that such should be stoned Moses actually Moses was told by God to give the priesthood to Aaron and Aaron's sons and the instruction of building the tabernacle and the instruction for the garments for the priests and the instruction for the priests to take offerings for sin 
and so on and so forth and the sacrifice and the sprinkling of blood and the washing of the utensils the bowls and basins etc so Moses didn't exactly command that the woman be stoned and in fact there is no stoning of any woman in the Old Testament or let me rephrase that well no there is no stoning of there is no stoning of a woman but there's no stoning of adulterers in the Old Testament um, by the congregation of Israel there's the penalty of death under the law but there's not one adulterous or fornicator or homosexual stoned in the Old Testament and it's my intention to go over those scriptures not today but to go over those scriptures with you we'll look at the free there's only free stonings in the Old Testament now does that mean they were the only stonings no it doesn't mean that but if the priesthood was set up correctly under Aaron and his sons if the tabernacle was set up correctly if the the commandment to take offerings righteous offerings unto the Lord if all that was observed correctly then there was absolutely no need for anyone to be stoned to death by the congregation and I'll, I'll show you that clearly in the scripture at some point um, now there were free stonings and we need to look at those quite carefully and clearly to understand why what they were about but like I say that is for another video but it's connected so maybe I'll do that quite soon God willing so now you can see now Moses this is what they're saying to Jesus master this woman was taken in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned but what sayest thou see this they said tempting him this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him you see how the the, the Pharisees here they've already made their mind up about Christ they're out to get him first of all they want to trap him if they can't trap him they'll they'll just use force as we see at the end of this chapter they pick up stones to kill Christ this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not now of course there's a lot of speculation as to what Jesus could be writing there's many different theories and in fact he does this twice let's just go down a little bit let's get a, a little bit ahead of ourselves here in verse 8 and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground so he does this twice okay so Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not because this isn't accurate at all it's not what Moses commanded them it's what the law commands Moses instructed having received instruction from God and in fact there's chapters and chapters in Exodus about while Moses was on the mountain of God with God and very small portion of that is him receiving the law 
but there's chapters and chapters of him receiving instruction on the tabernacle, the priesthood, the garments, etc., the sacrifices, and so on and so forth. So there's a number of things he could be writing here. I think it's about Psalm 50. I'll show you what I mean. We'll go to Psalm 50 and have a quick look. Okay, Psalm 50, Psalm of Asaph. Now we've got to remember, because I haven't looked at this for a while, but... Okay, verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above, and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. So it's interesting that the Pharisees are trying to make Jesus the judge in this matter because they don't believe that he is God. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. From verse 14, Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes? What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee, See, this is what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing. The scribes are there as well, remember. They're declaring God's statutes and taking his promises in their mouths. But they hate instruction. They're not there to receive instruction from Christ. They're there to tempt him to trap him seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee this is describing the John 8 Pharisees and scribes to a T when thou sawest the thief then thou contestest with him and hast been partaker with adulterers Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Okay, there's probably more in this chapter that's relevant, but you can read that Psalm 50 there. So I really do see why some would say Jesus might be quoting or referring to Psalm 50 when he wrote on the ground. You see how they're taking his statutes in their mouth. But they're not coming to him. They, they're appearing to come to him for instruction on the matter. But they're not they're casting, they want to cast his words behind them. Psalm 50 says, so yeah, I can see that. I can absolutely see that Jesus might well be referring to Psalm 50. Some people say, we don't really know. He could, of course, just be asking, you know, Moses commanded us, Moses in the law commanded us that such should
should be stoned. He might ask, actually be asking for a name. But I don't think so because Jesus stooped him with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So my initial thoughts were maybe he's asking them for a name. Give me a name of any adulteress stoned by the congregation of Israel in the scriptures. Because they'd have to prove it through the scriptures you see. But as though he heard them not so probably not maybe he is just writing a reference to Psalm 50. So when they continued asking him he lifted up himself and said unto them he that is without sin among you let him first cast a stone at her and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground now I would suggest it's only a suggestion because we don't know what he wrote on the ground exactly I would suggest he wrote a name King David King David was not without sin he was an adulterer and a murderer but in context here he was an adulterer he committed adultery with Bathsheba And if that's the name he wrote or the thing he wrote on the ground he would be implying that they would have had King David stoned to death according to their doctrine and I'm, I'm making that as quite a strong suggestion because although they reject Jesus and would be quite happy to see him stoned the Jews hold King David in very high regard very very high regard and I think it would have been fairly shocking if that indeed was what Jesus might have wrote on the ground here just the name King David so I'm not saying it was, I'm just putting it as a suggestion, something to think about. We don't know, as I say. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst and so just before we go on I want to come back to Mark chapter 6 at the scripture we looked at so Jesus he had sent the disciples away into a ship sending them up unto Bethsaida he had sent them away he departed into a mountain to pray and when the evening was come the ship was in the midst the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land now have a quick look at this Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst Jesus was left alone the woman standing in the midst the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land and he saw them toiling he saw them toiling and rowing for the wind 
was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them. When even was come, this is in the first watch of the night, the evening, or the first watch of the night, is around about 6 p.m. until about 9 p.m. And the fourth watch of the night is about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, there's a 12 hour period with four watches of three hours. And this colon here divides time. So everything here is in one time frame and everything hereafter is in another time, another time frame. So, so what we're going to see in John chapter 8 is something remarkably similar. Now I'm not going to do it now but we can cross reference this event, the event of the ship in the storm in the gospel accounts. I think it's mentioned in three of the accounts, maybe all four. Um, but it's a very, very interesting read to cross-reference. But look, look at what Jesus says here. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And I think what we're going to find in John chapter 8 is some incredible similarities or things that we can kind of connect together but I'll leave that for you to decide we'll go back into John 8 now and and we'll leave this story for another day I think so we're getting to the crux of what this passage is about here so the accusers have departed, been convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, being at, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone. He got an Oxford comma there, if you know what that is. It means that Jesus and the woman weren't standing exactly in the same place, okay? And Jesus was left alone. So that comma is very important because it separates Jesus from the woman, at least in position, physical position, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted him up himself, now look, I'll tell you why this comma is important. Because of this little word when when means some time has elapsed between this and this okay so the dynamics of this are very not just important, they're quite profound actually. Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So she's in the midst of what? She's in the midst of the temple. Okay, she's inside, they're in the temple. See, he came again into the temple he sat down, he taught, the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman, okay, and they set, had set her in the midst, in the midst of the temple. 
So Jesus is sat. He's sat and he's alone. The woman is standing in the midst of the temple. Now think about this. Her accusers have left. They've departed one by one. They went out one by one, out of the temple. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. So this when is important because some time has elapsed. It's not all happening immediately. We don't know how long. How long was this woman just standing there? Could be a very short when, could be 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, three minutes, five minutes. Of course, a minute or two minutes is gonna seem like a long time to her because we need to understand why she hasn't just left. You see, she's standing in the temple, in the midst of the temple. Think about this. If you've ever stood in a, a cathedral, which would be kind of comparable, I guess, or a big old church, these buildings are designed that the light comes in, the light comes in, and being in the midst, you're in the midst of the light. Think about this stone, big grandiose stone temple, where every sound, every sound, the, these places are, the temple was designed for singing. We see that in Second Samuel and in the Kings and Chronicles, about the building of the temple about the Solomon setting up the Levites and the singers. Every single sound, when you're in the midst, standing, she's standing alone in the midst of this temple. She's standing in the light. She's standing there in silence. And some time elapses so she could just quietly back off back into the dark recesses in the walls of the temple and slip out quietly through a door she could very very easily do that so why she stood there waiting because she knows who Christ is she knows who Jesus is and she's waiting for judgment See, Jesus isn't even looking at her. When Jesus was left alone, he's not looking at the woman. Because when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw, so during this time, this when here, he's not looking at the woman. She could very easily slip away. The accusers have gone. Christ hasn't accused her of anything. Has he? He's not accused her of anything. But she knows who Christ is. And she's waiting a judgment. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And you know what? That's the only three words from her we get in the whole of the scripture. No man, Lord. Well, she didn't know. She didn't know. If she knows that Christ is God 
he can judge her by law or by grace think about this now have no man condemned thee no man Lord she's calling him God because first of all Jesus never accused her they brought the Pharisees and scribes brought her to be judged by the law this is important and this goes back to the stonings in the Old Testament when the congregation bring the accused to God to be judged by the law the result is death so she has no idea if he's going to judge her according to the law or judge her under law or judge her under grace so by saying no man first and foremost she's acknowledging Jesus Christ as God and of course by calling him Lord his name is Lord a whole ton of Old Testament scriptures attest to the fact that Jesus name is Lord it's not a title it's his name now most likely he would have judged her under grace he saved her life when he wrote whatever he wrote on the ground he saved her life she's simply acknowledged him as God and she stood there when she stood there when she could have walked away she was putting her faith in his grace and she verbally now says acknowledges that he's God and Jesus said unto her neither do I condemn thee because she's just shown herself to be a believer and there's no condemnation for those in Christ neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more now look go and sin no more what a minefield of legalism and false doctrine that legal expression there brings up amongst so many you know go and sin no more so the legalist will say there you are he's told her never to sin again if she does she's going to lose her salvation etc 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 we know that's not true that's not the gospel so he says go and sin no more how are we supposed to interpret that so some will say that he's advising her not to get for you know not to allow herself to be put into situations that are traps that are going to get her into these kind of trouble and he's instructing her not to uh, do the same type of sin again no that's I think that's fairly reasonable but we've got to interpret scripture by the gospel not by private interpretation which is what the legalists do they're not interpreting scripture by the gospel go and sin no more if we interpret this by the gospel then we would say that Christ sees her sin no more okay and I'm going to give a scripture that will back up what true grace believers believe that this is not an instruction never to sin again or that she might lose her salvation 
Let's go to John 15. Jesus speaking, John 15, verse 3 says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So, a couple of things here. Now, it's immediate. This is immediate now. It's not future, it's present. Ye are clean. So he's speaking to the disciples. Plural, ye. Now ye are clean. So ye are clean doesn't mean they're in the process of being cleaned. Jesus isn't saying now ye are being cleaned or now have you begun to be cleaned no he says now ye are clean through the word which i have spoken unto you through the word which i have spoken unto you now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you okay so remember what he said the conversations are all important woman where are thine or those thine accusers have no man condemned thee she said no man Lord that's all she said in this whole passage and Jesus said unto her neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more now remember what Jesus says in John 15 now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you or by the word which I have spoken unto you now ye are clean go and sin no more go thy way sin no more remember the woman with the issue of blood what did he say to her thy faith have made thee whole you see what's true of one believer concerning salvation at least has to be true of all here we are the woman with the issue of blood who touched his garment in faith Jesus said unto her daughter thy faith hath made thee whole go go in peace and be whole of thy plague be whole of thy plague there you are go and sin no more go in peace and be whole of thy plague now does that shed light on that scripture daughter thy faith hath made thee whole go sin no more can you see it go in peace and behold of thy plague daughter thy faith have made thee whole go in peace and behold of thy plague let's go back to John 8 he always says go doesn't he Jesus says go he always says come or go have you noticed that Go in peace and be whole of thy plague and sin no more. See, do you get it? Are you getting that? Are you picking that up? Yeah. Pick it up, grasp it, keep hold of it because you got two women saved by faith. The woman here, the woman in the midst. I'm not going to call her the adulterous woman. Did you notice that? I don't call her that why because Jesus said go and sin no more she does not she should not be identified by her sin so I'll call her the John 8 woman or I'll call her the woman in the midst yeah because you know this is a sister in Christ that we will inevitably because we've got eternity ahead of us 
inevitably meet and speak to and be uh, a brother or sister to so we've got to get out of the habit of calling her the adulterous woman I don't think that's right it doesn't make any sense to me anyway so I call her the woman in the midst because Jesus said go and sin no more meaning go in peace and be whole of thy plague so her sin is her plague it's comparable to the woman with the issue of blood it's it's totally comparable because we're talking the gospel we're talking salvation it doesn't change it's not different from one person to another so Jesus responds to the woman with the issue of blood it's he's saying the same thing here he does not condemn her go and sin no more in other words be whole be whole correction is healing yeah so I think it's in is it in second Timothy uh, is it second Timothy 316 let me show you I want to get this right so that we can finish up maybe there second Timothy 3 there we are I've been looking at this recently okay correction let me tell you what these things are okay because we divide to understand the parts and then we put the parts together again to get the meaning so all scripture is profitable for doctrine that's the gospel I will I will go through this in more detail at some point but just quickly doctrine is the gospel that's what the Bible is for it's a book of salvation the doctrine of the Bible is salvation It's the gospel reproof and I'm gonna I'm gonna prove this reproof means we re prove the doctrine by using other scriptures so if there's a scripture that says one thing we reproof I know people think reproof here means something else it doesn't and I'm going to show this in another video so doctrine is the gospel reproof means proving the gospel reproving the gospel with whatever you know as many scriptures as you can correction the, these things are all in sequence the gospel for salvation or the gospel for preach uh, the doctrine for preaching the gospel reproving the doctrine of the gospel so that people believe it then on belief correction which is healing and I'm going to show you this in scripture not today though correction is healing by the gospel by Christ and instruction in righteousness then after the gospel salvation healing instruction in righteousness then is to go ahead and serve God amen anyway I'm going to leave that there I think I was going to go into something else as well I'm not going to do that today because wow another long video but it's all good hopefully I've spoken mostly directly into this microphone so you can hear me and hopefully the sound quality has improved for you um, which would make me happy it really would if it, the quality is better I'm gonna make the quality better still when I've I'm still in my echoey space and I'm gonna be buying things and moving things around but that's all in God's timing uh, so yeah I'll leave it there that's the woman in the midst and there's another woman in the midst in scripture as well and I'm I'm not going to go into that now I don't think because yeah it's connected though so I ought to but I I want to leave that there John chapter 8 as that thing on its own okay the woman in the midst a woman standing in the midst amen may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen